Waverly Knobs Entertainment presents the Branch Out Podcast with your hosts Evan Charles Anderson and Tatiana Ivan. We discuss all the exciting facets of digital media and marketing for businesses and professionals. Our goal is to empower you so you can increase your knowledge, engagement, and brand identity. Let's get ready to branch out. Thank you for listening once again to Branch Out, the digital media and marketing podcast with Evan Charles Anderson and Tatiana Ivan. We hope you've been having a great day thus far. We know we have. We've been very excited this year and very fortunate this year to have some fantastic interviews and really touching base on some really exciting topics that thanks to you, the listener who has given us some great ideas on what to really touch on, we're able to give you more and more great content. And with that said, if you haven't yet, make sure to review us, subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, SoundCloud, and what have you. Let us know your thoughts and what you want to hear, and we'll make sure to get that into one of our future podcasts. But now, talking about amazing interviews, we are very fortunate to have Mr. Dan Teff, the co-founder and CEO of Climb It LLC, with us today. He is a serial social entrepreneur dedicated to developing profitable systems for engaging the public in the process of funding sustainability projects. Try to say that 10 times fast. He's also a 2006 graduate of CEO Space. He's also the former president CEO of Tree Banking Inc. and publishes his online newspaper, which is Climate Solutions Daily. He's also been featured in Financial Times, New York Times, USA Today, and others. And really, just from this intro, I feel like I'm introducing a wrestler, like coming in in 220 (laughs) pounds, and the tree banker, Dan Teff. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Evan and Tatiana. I'm glad to be here. We're excited to have you on because it's really great, especially in this time to talk about climate change, the impact of it, but then also to talk about your business, which is basically reinforcing and assisting other sustainable companies to come out there and really have an impact on specific industries and really overall have an impact on the earth. Um, So, I mean, with this, before we get too far ahead into where you're at now, can you give us a little bit of a walkthrough of your professional journey Uh, especially as the social entrepreneur, which you're the first on our show thus far to be a social entrepreneur. And also, have you always had an interest in, I mean, basically saving all of our lives from ourselves? (laughs) That's interesting. The, uh, I thought, when's the first time I realized that, you know, I want to dedicate my life to helping people. And I remember back in middle school or, or high school, where the guidance department did a uh, aptitude you know we all do an aptitude test and my aptitude test they said oh well you like to help people so you'd be a good like a fireman or a paramedic or a nurse or something like that but back then i was too worried about being a macho biker and having too much fun (laughs) and i'm like no that's not me i'm wasn't sure what i was going to be but those didn't it didn't vibrate at the time so Fast forward, I don't know, another like 25 years after high school, I was in an accident. My background is um, fiber optics and telecommunications. And when the tech bubble burst in 2000, I switched over to high voltage power. I was a high voltage um, power lineman for a while. Had an accident at work, broke my arm really badly. It seemed like a career ending injury at the time. And while I was on compensation healing from that, I've always been kind of entrepreneurial. I've always had something going on the side, but I really started focusing on the idea of, you know, I want to have my own business for the rest of my life. I want to actually build a business, but it has to be something that's not exploitive. You know, it has to be something that does good for people or for the planet or just does good. And I was fortunate enough, I'd moved to Colorado and I was invited to a presentation of a company that was raising money for, I don't know if you're familiar with an investment vehicle called a REIT, uh, Real Estate Investment Trust, where they have a system in place for raising money to buy homes for people 
that maybe couldn't qualify. You know, it's, it happened during the subprime lending times, unfortunately, but it was a system for using one person's credit worthiness to buy another house and they could put, they put people in, uh, that wouldn't normally be able to afford that house in that house. It was a, a socially conscious business idea for real estate. And it made sense to me. You know, I, I sat and talked to them for, I don't know, for hours, you know, for like a week straight and asked them questions. And it finally, I thought, wow, this is a, a great way for me to work and do good in the world. And I started to work with these guys looking for clients, essentially. And that morphed into raising money for them. And I seemed to have a knack for it. I raised a couple million dollars for them and their and that project at the time. And because of that, they are the ones who sent me to business school. And um, I went to school at, at CEO Space. And we could talk a little bit more about that later. But at CEO Space, I realized that all of the laws associated with compliance for raising capital for businesses, I was fascinated by it. Most of the people there are just bored and it's like one of those <laughs> courses that they, you have to take and they're just bored to tears. And I, I just kind of, you know, I was fascinated by the whole thing. And within the next year or so after that, I started thinking, well, how can I use what I'm learning about business and raising money to actually do good, a lot of good in the world? And that's where the first iteration of this business came from, Tree Banking Inc., which was a profitable system for replanting tropical rainforests. And then it just kind of evolved into, you know, the bumpy road between the uh, economic downturn 2008-2009 and that, you know, bottomed out. And fast forward to today and this business that we're working on now. I was going to say, I, I love the name Tree Banker or Tree Banking. I, it sounds like such an awesome idea because it feels like it combines something that's wholesome and organic and, and wonderful and like gives life with this idea of, you know, I don't know, banks are, especially nowadays, they're not looked at favorably, but it's also, you know, it also talks about kind of savings and sort of gathering something that can better help you in the future. So I love, I love that name. I was just going to say, I, you know, ever since I first heard it, I, I thought that was really great. In terms of branding, you know, it's, it's, it gets the idea across so well, like, and then, of course, the fact that it actually also has to do with, you know, rainforest and actual trees. It's, it's just very nice. Well, thank you. You also have an interesting name with your current company, which is Climate, which is spelled C-L-I-M-E dash I-T. Right. So can you explain to our audience a little bit more about that name and the branding of that? Sure. Sure. That's actually, I give my, uh, my wife the credit for, for coming up with that. She's kind of the creative in the, on the team my co-founder, Annie, and um, we were, you know, we're kicking around names, wrote down a whole list of names, and she's the one that came up with that. You know, it's the idea of IT, because of what we do is, you know, it's internet, it's disruption, fintech, and it has to do with, you know, working online, and so it's it's uh, information technology, and it's the climate. So we, Annie knit those two together into that into that brand, and uh, yeah, it's, it's working out pretty well for us. And it's nice too because if you just even hear it, um, you know, it gives you the sense that you're you're going up towards a goal that you're sort of working together to go up, which is always you know upward mobility and that sort of kind of idea is always nice too. Exactly. It's Thank nice. You. So your current company it provides a platform for businesses and socially conscious entrepreneurs who are interested in, in the low carbon solutions in climate change solutions to come together and essentially use capitalism for good. Exactly. And the, the mission is to create a sustainable future from crowd investing. Now, putting aside, if that's even possible, the politics of climate change, you know, what are some of the other challenges the green or, or clean technologies and entrepreneurs face in the market? How can climate help them? I think the, the biggest challenge that businesses that are focused on renewable energy or climate change solutions, at the most basic level, it's the same problems that all startup businesses face right now. Ever since the economic downturn, 2008, 2009, less and less money is going to startup companies. It's getting harder and harder for startups to raise capital, unless you're in San Francisco and you've already launched a number of, and you're a, you know, a serial entrepreneur who's launched, ran, and exited out of, and you have access to your own funding. But for uh, what I call, you know, rank and file entrepreneurs, raising money is, it's getting harder and harder. 
venture capitalists, if that's the way that you go for money, demand more and more well-refined business plans, I guess you could say. And the idea now of trying to use this for renewable energy here in the United States, there's a big pushback from the utility companies and from politicians and from those existing systems against renewable energy because they're trying to maintain the status quo. You know, and I understand we were talking earlier about people trying to understand where other people are coming from in order to figure out how to work with them. And um, one of the big issues right now is that people are who are invested in these utility companies, these coal-fired or these legacy utility companies, actually a lot of them um, pay dividends back, you know, monthly or quarterly dividends back to their investors. That's a significant income stream for a lot of people. They're invested in these utilities and that money, you know, of course you want, those people want that money to continue to come to them. So they're resistant to change, you know, like most people are resistant to change at some at some point. And the the resistance to renewable energy is, is uh, tangible here in the United States. In order to have cleaner air, you have to cut emissions uh, from coal-fired power plants, which are the number one source of carbon emissions in the United States. That's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Now, in Europe and other places in the world, that's not necessarily the case. There are um, a lot of... Uh, India and Africa and developing countries are leapfrogging directly over the whole, you know, fossil fuel generation of power into renewable energy. So it's growing faster around the rest of the world than it is here in the U.S. So that's that's part of what we do is we're focusing a lot of our energy in working in developing countries as opposed to just here in the United States. Yeah, I know I just heard as of recently, too, that India was looking to launch tons of just solar panels and just really try to get completely off of uh, coal and fossil fuels because, I mean, they're actually doing smog selfies. Uh, people in the different you know, cities in India are doing smog selfies to show the impact of smog and how thick it is there and how horrible it is there because you can barely see the sky at times, sometimes not at all. You could barely see a couple feet in front of you because of the amount of smog that's being produced from all the factories and everything else. And also all the cars. I mean, their population has blown up just in the past 10 years. So with that, the amount of pressure put onto the energy industry and everything there has had to exponentially grow, but they just weren't prepared for the, the results of using that much energy that quickly. The government in India's capital has shut down 1,800 schools for the first time ever, forcing a million students to stay at home to avoid breathing in the deadly smog that continues to shroud the city. Yeah, exactly. And the, one of the the, the struggles that they have in the developing world, India especially, is that they, they're they determined to bring electricity to the you know a few billion people that they have in there that don't have electricity now. And they want, that's a part of raising the standard of living for those people. They're determined to bring them electricity. They would rather do it with renewable energy, but that takes a different type of investment than doing it with coal-fired. They can get the money to build a coal-fired plant from any number of investors that are already, you know, they're trying to prop up those those legacy systems, but it's harder to get money for renewable, it has been, I should say, it has been harder to get money for renewable energy, but now that's, we're in the middle of, of watching that shift. At the same time, it seems that everywhere we go, Solar City has an ad. <laughs> I hear them on the radio, I see it on Facebook, I watch Hulu and they're there. So... How has the marketing landscape, you know, digital, print, audio, <laughs> how has that changed for renewable energy solutions just in the past few years? And, you know, how can companies actually utilize digital media to their advantage, whether it's to crowdsource, you know, uh, crowdfunding or... Um, and then that's part of the IT thing that I, I really believe that the transition over to renewable energy around the world will be promoted through social media, will be promoted digitally. Have you guys read Jeremy Rifkin's book, The Third Industrial Revolution? You're familiar with that concept. So Jeremy Rifkin's book, it's, uh, it's a little dated, 2010, 
you know, as fast as everything changes nowadays, that's that's almost a, a whole th- decade ago. <laughs> I know that's almost a whole decade. But the premise of his book is that industrial revolutions happen when communication systems come together with new energy sources. The first industrial revolution started at the beginning of the printing press, which brought books and and literacy to quite a few more people on the planet than (laughs) were there before, and um, steam power. It was steam power to to create the energy for the printing press and to printed books. So that was the beginning of the first industrial revolution. Inventors had found new ways to harness nature's energy. They built new kinds of machines powered by water, steam, and coal. As that, that lasted about 100 years or so, as that started to drop off, the second industrial revolution was when internal combustion based on petroleum met the telephone and electric communications. So that was the beginning of the second industrial revolution. Now we're all in the midst of watching that drop off. If you look forward, it's pretty easy to see that the second industrial revolution is coming to the end of it of its life cycle. Now the third industrial revolution is the combination of renewable energy and communication through the internet. We're at the very beginning of the third industrial revolution right now. So we're here to encourage people to take advantage of being at the very beginning of it participating in the actual creation of history as as we're part of it right now. Exactly. That's fascinating. I didn't really think about, you know, the history of some of those technologies in that in that manner. That's it's amazing. Well, in social media has really awoken people, just the internet in general, the access to the information out there has really awoken people as of I think even just the past few years who might have just kind of taken it for granted and really have awoken them in the sense of understanding where the climate is going. And to see that social impact is, is amazing. And that information otherwise would not have been accessible, you know, or so easily accessible, and people could have just continued to ignore it. But the fact that that information is now online and that people can so readily share it and people can get involved, I think it is really key. I think that's a great way of looking at it is that, well, it affects us all, so let's see how we can bring everyone in whether it's through promotion of it, whether it's through signing petitions to let your congressman or congresswoman know about, you know, wanting to drive more sustainable green technologies and systems for energy. And it's great that other people too can use tools like films, you know, to kind of bring even more awareness to people who maybe aren't on social media or don't aren't really on the internet or aren't really interested in finding out this information because they're not surrounding themselves with this type of information. and. I think Leonardo DiCaprio did a, a film whose name escapes me at this moment, but I remember watching it and, you know, I didn't I didn't walk away from it sort of being, you know, wowed by any new information because I already kind of knew some of that stuff, but it was interesting to see some of the reactions of people who, you know, only watched the film because Leonardo DiCaprio was attached to it, but it was something that they that was easily accessible for them and easy to share and easy to talk about and easy to sort of understand in their mind frame. The U.S. has been the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in history. You're a fossil addicted country. We are doing more investment in solar today than the U.S. is. Dan, what do you see as the future of this new energy economy? You know, what what will it take for it to surpass, eventually, hopefully replace the current oil based economy? Sure. Um, I think we're already we're seeing We've, we've reached a tipping point where it is going to become more popular because the uh, the cost of solar has come down so much that it for investors, it almost doesn't make sense not to invest in it. Like I mentioned earlier, it's taking off a little bit faster in Europe than it is here, but I think that what we're going to see is um, this distributed generation. Right now, the system that we're all accustomed to is these big electrical generation stations and they transmit the electricity out and then distribute it among all the houses. What we're going to see in the future, what we're actually starting to see growing now is community-based solar where the communities generate their own electricity and sell it into either among themselves or sell it to the grid for other people who want to buy electricity. It's it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the idea of this um, the electrical system actually being kind of like a pool of electricity that if you say you're buying green energy, you know, you're paying someone to generate green energy somewhere, it goes into the pool and you draw it somewhere else and you draw out of the pool 
and you can actually say that you're buying renewable energy because it's mixed in with all the other electricity. So it's all in this big pool. But what I think we're going to see in the future is where most homes are um, either have their own solar generation, like, you know, solar rooftops, or they're part of a community array somewhere. If their house isn't suitable for having that, they own a stake in um, a, a solar array in their neighborhood or something like that. And it's easy for me to imagine waking up in the morning and the sun is shining and you're thinking, all right, I'm making money today. <laughs> <laughs> That's way better than the stocks because you know the sun is coming out. Yeah, point. and then on, on cloudy days, you think, oh, well, you know, I'm buying electricity today. So I think that's what we're going to see, and it's a little out of my uh, uh, out of my expertise, but I'm starting to understand that um, blockchain technology is actually emerging as a system for keeping track of that blockchain with the uh, Internet of Things, you know, IoT technology. They can actually measure how much electricity your house is either putting into the grid or drawing from the grid, and that's how the payments will be. Kind of divvied accounted, up. accounted for, yeah, how it will be accounted for. So I'm interested to uh, to find out more about that and talk to some people who are on the cutting edge of that. These uh, MIT students and uh, Harvard students that I keep reining them in. It's like, whoa, 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 slow down here. Well, you're definitely in the right area for that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's a big part of it. We really enjoy being here because of those conversations. And to go a little gamer nerd here, um, it's sort of like being part of a guild in an MMO, and you have a guild bank, so you can deposit some some of your stuff in there that you don't want for your character, and then take some stuff out that maybe you do want for your character. So, for anybody who's listening out there who is into MMOs, you'll that get that reference. That would make so much sense. Yes, that would make, For the rest of you, just nod and smile. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I definitely want to bring up this quote that's on your website because I absolutely loved it and I think it's a, a very valid point and, and it really kind of I guess opened my eyes even more so to the concept of this but you know now that we're looking at the future of new energy and we've talked about the importance of it on the environment because we can see such things as for instance rampant smog like in China and in India and things like that such as earthquakes and such as the melting of the polar ice caps and now more areas are getting higher higher sea levels because of that and so now you know sea coasts are eroding in so with this I wanted to bring up this quote and, and get more of an elaboration from you on it but it says Deniers argue we were warned years ago of impeding global disasters that haven't happened yet and conclude there were just the ramblings of the doomsayers. Say you were diagnosed with terminal cancer and you've defied the doctor's predictions. Would you say that they had the wrong diagnosis? Or would you use the gift of more time to make changes to improve your odds further? And I love the fact that the emphasis is on the more time. It's not the fact that, oh, well, we've beaten it. it because this because X, Y, and Z did not occur means that, oh, we're clear of it then, we're fine. No, it just means luckily somehow in this weird cosmic way, we were given more time. Now, how do we take that on? So what are your thoughts and what was kind of your, I guess, push or drive behind putting something like that on your website as well? Most of the people who adamantly deny the changes that are happening in the climate right now are basing their opinions on weather uh, essentially in their backyard. Where just because in their backyard they haven't had a tornado or a giant storm or, or something like that, they think it's not happening anywhere. If they're not, you know, if they went to Miami, for example, and stood in the neighborhoods that have, they call them sunny day, um, sunny day floods, where they're actually standing there. The sea, level ha the sea level has come up to the point where on sunny days when the high tide reaches and this, the streets are flooded. I don't mean flooded like six feet high, but flooded like knee deep, you know, in, in neighborhoods where people have lived for decades and never had any problems until just the last few years. Or places like um, like Bangladesh, where the water levels are, are rising to the point where people have to move further and further. Or, or like you mentioned, um, 
um, seacoast eroding away up in Alaska and around the Arctic Circle. If people would take the time to look at, look for places where the climate change is having a dramatic effect on people's lives, I think they'd be more willing to accept the fact that it, you know, that it is, it is actually happening. These um, back-to-back storms, these um, big cold snaps that we have, you know, we, they call it the polar vortex a few years ago. Well, here in the United States, most people don't realize that those big, really super cold polar snaps are happening in other parts of the world. It's not happening here, so they, well, you know, we didn't have any big, we didn't have any extreme weather this year. Well, around the world, if you look around the world, it's you look in Australia right now. They're having this, this, using their words, a horrific heat wave right now. Where I think the the air temperature in Fahrenheit is up like 130 degrees. Hottest heat wave of the summer is expected for much of the country today. Firefighters are on standby across New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland, with authorities in Sydney even warning of rolling blackouts. For more, I'm joined by... It's ridiculous. Wow. So these people that, that think, well, we haven't had, you know, we've been lucky here in the United States, so climate change isn't happening, are, aren't looking at the big picture. So whether... This is buying us time, you know, the fact that we've, we've, um, we've uh, delayed action on this is actually, you know, I wake up every morning thinking, oh man, the, the world got hotter while I was sleeping. And I actually, I'm driven by that. I'm driven by the fact that if we don't act, you know, if we don't get our act together pretty quickly, there is actually a risk of the planet not being able to sustain humanity within the next, you know, some scientists say another um, 100, 150 years that the storms could actually be so bad that, you know, everything is coming apart, the whole uh, extinction events that we're in right now and all the changes that it's going to be hard to find food to feed everybody. It's going to be... It's a mess. It's unraveling for anyone who's watching it. Climate scientists who dedicate their lives to it are, are depressed. It's, so we really haven't had the luxury. We don't have the luxury of waiting any longer. That's why I'm dedicated to figuring out a way that gets people to be a part of the solution and benefit from it in a way that they understand at the same time something they, they can benefit financially from it. You know, it's always been, we mentioned earlier at the, at the very beginning of this when you read my, uh, the introduction, a, profitable, a way for engaging people in the process of investing in climate change solutions. Well, I want everyone to, to invest. I want to create systems. I'm in the process of creating systems that allow people to earn as good a return on their investment from essentially doing the right thing. You know, why would you... You want to invest in something that's polluting or you want to get the same return on something that's helping clean the planet for future generations. Most people, if you give them the choice between doing the right thing and doing something that's obviously wrong or borderline wrong. So I, I really, I believe that when you appeal to people's better nature and you give them a choice of doing, if you're going to get the same benefit from doing something that's borderline wrong or something that's obviously right, they're going to uh, choose to do the right thing. And for those people that are deciding that they want to do the right thing right now, what would be the next steps for them? So what would be the next steps for them to get involved with climate change or kind of the industry that you're in of, of supporting these industries or these people, these companies that want to bring in sustainable energy and a new way of doing something? The most obvious way is to look for um, the uh, new term that's becoming more commonly used is impact investing. Investing for positive impact. Earlier we were talking about the idea of social entrepreneur. The, um, that's kind of shifting a little bit because social people equate social with social media or socialism. And it's not, you know, if there are some people obviously who think that if you're uh, a tree hugger, 
you're automatically a socialist and you want the government to redistribute the money and all of that, whatever goes along with socialism. And that's, that's not the case. This is capitalism. This is free market capitalism for doing good for yourself, for the planet, for, for everyone involved. So next steps would, for me, would always be look for um, impact investing. If it's um, what we call retail investors, people who have, you know, a couple thousand dollars in their 401k or something like that, you can actually convert that some of the money in your 401k into a self-directed IRA. With the self-directed IRA, you can invest in almost anything. So if you want to support your community solar project and earn, you can earn income, you can earn a, a return on your investment like that, support you know, local solar, community-based solar. There's so many different things that speak to different people's hearts. You know, some people are into renewable energy. Some people are into helping people relocate because of, because of the climate change. There's all kinds of great nonprofits if you're looking to donate to, to help people cope with the um, changes, climate changes. But investment, there are a lot of different ways to invest. It's, it's all readily available online. So go ahead and use that Google machine there, uh, your handy dandy Google machine that's in your hand, in your pocket, or on your lap, or wherever else uh, your device is, and check it out. But we'll also put some links down below in the description as well. And also we'll put some more information on Dan and his company and his drives and passions and everything right there in the description below. And to kind of close out, can you tell us what are some of the next steps for a climate then? I mean, where, where's your company going and what are some things that you're seeing thus far? Sure. So kind of in a nutshell, what climate is, the, the idea that climate is based on is uh, the new Jobs Act, the securities laws based on how businesses raise money for themselves. The most profound changes in securities laws since 1934, there's two main um, changes that the uh, the Jobs Act brought to securities law. One is that it allows businesses that are raising capital to promote to the world that they are yeah, they can uh, present their opportunity, their investment opportunity to the world through online portals, similar to a Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or something like that. Except that Kickstarter, and Indiegogo, and GoFundMe, and those types of sites are all reward based. But what we do is that the Jobs Act in business models like ours actually allows businesses to raise capital for themselves, to launch their businesses in exchange for equity in the company. You sell shares in your company. The other big change that the Jobs Act brought to us was that from 1934 until just recently, only accredited investors, people who make $200,000 a year or their house is worth a million dollars, that sort of thing, were the only ones who were allowed to invest in startup companies. That's 7% of the nation, 7% of the United States. So now the other 93% of the country <laughs> has just been given the legal right to invest in startup companies. So that's what we're doing. We're launching one a portal like that where businesses that are focused on climate change that are looking to raise money for themselves um, can post on the site and investors can go and, and we market to investors we and we market to clean tech business incubators looking for projects all the time and um, investors can go online at their leisure instead of waiting for a shark tank moment you know it's you know, for us, the most important thing is create efficiency in the process of sourcing projects and getting projects online, essentially. And the we're in the process of, you know, registering with the, the SEC and getting all of our licensure and putting together all of the, the entire team that we need to launch our business and um, our site. We're expected to go live um, sometime this summer or in the fall. And um, we're actually launching five portals at the same time, one here in the United States, based here in Boston. And with our partners overseas, we're also launching in the EU, India, Indonesia, and somewhere in Africa, I'm not sure yet, kind of depends. We have a couple of different places that we're looking at in Africa where we'll actually house the, uh, the funding portal 
and our clean tech and each of those funding portals is also supported by a, a network of clean tech business incubators so that's we're in the process of writing all that curriculum for the businesses so they understand how to do crowdfunding and um, that's where we're at and we're it's kind of an all day every day thing to get all those pieces together to be ready to launch this summer sounds exciting <laughs> that's very exciting thank you yeah, it's a lot to look forward to, and it's already been a lot to, to see and see the process and hear from you directly about where it's going and how it's been growing and, and all the great news that's been coming out of all your hard work. So we definitely commend you on that, give you the utmost respect on all the hard work that you've put into Climate LLC and all the hard work that you're putting into and planning out for the future. So thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for being on the show today. Well, thanks for having me. Look forward. I really enjoyed it. For you, the listener, make sure to check out the links down below. We have some more information on some of the information we spoke about today, as well as we have Climate LLC's website down below. So make sure to check out their website, sign up for their newsletter, and get the latest updates for when they fully go into launch phase. And also make sure to like, subscribe. We're on Facebook.com slash Branch Out Podcast, all one word. Make sure to do something positive for the earth and tell us about it on our Facebook page. Again, facebook.com slash branch out podcast. So until then, stay green and we'll talk to you soon.